Good morning to each of you. I was um, uh, glad when Sean asked me a few weeks ago, he said, we're going to be doing a new series called Kingdom Come, talking about the kingdom of God. Would you be able to come and, yep. <laughs> um, I, before I discovered in a more personal way the, the deeper revelation of the Father's love, uh, a big shift for me happened going from focusing on the church, trying to help the church, go to the church, invite folks to church, 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 to the kingdom of God and seeing the difference in what it is like to advance the kingdom of God, promote the kingdom of God versus just inviting people to church. I think our, our invitation to the world is, is not to come to the church. Our invitation to the world is to come into the kingdom of God. And let me tell you, those conversations are different. Especially today, in our world that seems to have an increasing adversarial position towards the church. Inviting people to church invokes a different response today than it did 25 years ago. Um, and it's not just the church, but as, as an institution, people see the church as an institution, and so there's a, a decrease in the trust of all institutions, whether it be government, whether it be entertainment, whether it be the church, there's a decrease in the trust of institutions across the board. So, from a advancement perspective, our best first step in talking with people should not be come to my church. It's not a biblical first step, and now it's not a practical <laughs> first step. I'm not saying don't invite people. Notice specifically I said first step. So there's more that as a church we could do and should do in equipping you to have different kinds of conversations out there than just come to my church. Because I don't really know the Bible, but my guy does. <laughs> I don't know the answers to your questions, but my pastor is amazing. Right? We, we, we keep on outsourcing our God-ordained opportunities in relationships that God has put us in with people to say, come here, the stranger who is an expert on the Bible. And our worship is great, and your kids will love our kids' ministry. That, that's not the design that God has planned for those conversations when he has opened up someone's heart to him. And not just someone, someone in your life. That, that's your relationship. That's your conversation. That's your moment. And I think that the past few years, decades, the church as an institution has thought institutionally. And the primary goal of an institution is to preserve itself. So when a church thinks institutionally, and then it, its goal is to make sure it survives, then it cannot help but turn every member of the institution into a person who thinks about the survival of the institution first, 
which means how this plays out is that we tell you not to necessarily worry about what Jesus said for you to do in going and sharing the gospel, but we turn you into, into recruitment members to the church, not necessarily the kingdom. So institutions need members, require things of members. They turn you into members. Kingdom movements don't. Kingdom movements need you to know that you're part of a family of God and you are to be led by God in whatever you do, wherever you go. Even if it means leaving here to go somewhere else, we would celebrate that, but an institution would say, no, 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 we don't want you to go because we need your gifts, we need your talents here so we can survive. That is antithetical to the advancement of a kingdom. And part of the challenge today in America's churches is trying to balance the tension of the institutional need for more members and the members' impulse to live out kingdom purpose. The so kingdom purpose is out there. But the institution says you need to be here. Bring all your, every, everything you got, bring it here so we can grow, so we can have attendance. And, that, and that's not the goal. That's not the goal. It's not that it shouldn't happen, but that's not the goal. That's not the goal. If you are encountering someone in your family, at work, or a neighbor, or whoever, a stranger in the grocery store, and you have this kingdom moment where you're talking to them about Jesus or God or whatever, and you think that the win is getting them into this building, that's what I'm saying is off. That's institutional thinking. The win is getting them into the kingdom and whatever those steps look like, the next, the, the next best step might be a Starbucks conversation, a Panera conversation, or, or even in the moment, let's hang out on these benches right here because God is up to something. There's a Jesus and the woman at the well kind of moment. Let's not pass it up and, and let's not think that as believers, the best we can do is invite them to an event. when we need to know that as members of the family of God and in the, the kingdom of God, that moment is to invite them into the kingdom, whether or not they walk into a building ever in their life. Kingdom. Kingdom. Kingdom first. Jesus never told us to build a church, although we have all kinds of church building strategies. That's not our role. Our role is to let them know that the kingdom is here. Now, in case you think I'm making it up, I got some scriptures, so this will be, <laughs> so be an official sermon in just a moment. <laughs> but this was a, and let me tell you where some of my angst comes from. My angst comes from growing up promoting church. The thing I just got through saying is what I've, 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 I've had that. And there's something about it that get, it gets passed on from generation to generation. Church first, church first, church first. And people know more about their church than they do about the kingdom of God. You know more about ministries than you do about parables. I mean, that's a symptom. Just so you know what I'm talking about. Right? I was, I was talking with some people before. And they're like um, they're being followers of Jesus. And you, who do you love? Who do you love more, Jesus or Michael Jackson? I'm like, oh, Jesus for sure. Are you, are you? Would you say you're a follower of Jesus or a follower of Michael Jackson? I'm a follower of Jesus. Whose words do you know more of? Right. If that beat drops right now, you're going to be. <laughs> right, you're just, you just going to get it, right? You just, you don't, it won't take much at all. It won't take, come on, somebody. Get, anybody, know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. Woo! 
Because it's carpet. That's why I do it. He, he talked about the moonwalk. I was like, I, I can't do it on the carpet. I, I can't do that. The world has discipled us in ways we don't even know we're being discipled. And there is a pull and a tug that is anti-Christ to where we would say out loud, I'm a follower of Jesus. But then talk about how it's hard for us to, it's hard for us to remember scriptures. Anybody ever heard that? I can't remember the, the scriptures. If we put it to a beat, you would. <laughs> if we put it to a song, you would. How, why all of a sudden you got memory problems now? I'm telling you, because it's not about memory. It's about heart. And the world has been discipling us. I think it was, uh, his name was uh, Daryl Miller. He said, if the church does not disciple the world, the world will disciple the church. And we've been discipled. We have affinities in our hearts for certain things in the world, and it's opposite of following Jesus. And, and we, we learn the ways of the world, we learn the ways of the culture, we learn their values and their principles, and it's taught to us in all kinds of ways. It's taught to us at work, it's taught to us in music, it's taught to us in media and movies that we watch, it's, it's taught to us. And then in a small portion of our lives, we're trying to get connected with Christians, we're trying to pray, we're trying to read and study the word, but that's a small percentage of the time throughout our day and throughout our week. It's a small percentage. So there's a smaller influence but then we are absorbed right we don't have time to read scriptures but we will binge watch something for hours right but we lie to us i don't have time no, no you know you're lying to yourself i want you to recognize where your heart is here's why this is so important because this series will just be cool graphics and slides if our hearts are not in alignment with the king of the kingdom. And we cannot advance the kingdom of God while our hearts are attached to the things of the world. The kingdom of God is in opposition to the kingdom of this world. And you cannot change the world with the power of the kingdom living with the influence of the world. We have to confront how much the world has grasped our hearts and be real about it because if you don't know where you're starting from, you'll be delusional into thinking you'll actually make progress to where you want to go. The fact of the matter is that there are roots of the world's values and principles that have taken roots in our hearts. It's there. It's there. You want to know how I know? Think about how hard it is for us to just love people. It's hard. We hold bitterness and grudges and resentment just like uh, un unbelievers. We hold unforgiveness just like unbelievers. We seek power and control just like unbelievers. We have insecurity and fear just like unbelievers. Oh, now I can tell y'all listening. <laughs> and I've had to confront this even in my own heart. We can go through all the motions and not really take a temperature what's happening in our hearts. And you cannot advance the kingdom of God to tear down the strongholds of the world if those strongholds of the world are in your heart. You just won't do it. You just won't do it. And so... We talk about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where does that happen? It happens in the hearts of men, women, boys and girls. Everywhere. The rule and reign of God in the hearts of people. The rule and reign of God in your heart. In your heart, 
That's the kingdom. And when you carry that around in your heart, it emerges out of your character. People will meet the character of Christ through you if Christ is ruling in you. They will encounter him. They will, and you wouldn't have to say much, you wouldn't have to do much. They will, and even if they don't even know what to call it, there's something has changed in the room. Yeah, somebody you can't see just showed up because there's a person who carried him into the room because there is a person who in their heart has submitted to the lordship, kingship, the messiahship, the majesty of Jesus Christ in their heart. And anywhere Christ rules on the throne, he changes atmospheres effortlessly. So if he's not, listen, if he, if he is not actually ruling in the throne of your heart, I don't care how much you try to throw out Jesus' name, you won't use it with authority. Jesus' name has power and authority, listen, when used by those who have submitted to it. There were 10 sons of a guy named Sceva who tried to cast out demons using the name of Jesus. They saw somebody else cast out demons in Jesus' name, and so they tried to cast out demons out of this guy. We cast you out in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches, not the name of the Jesus that we know, not the name of the Jesus that we have submitted to and surrendered to. But we saw Paul cast out demons in Jesus' name, and so we cast you out in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. And the demon was like, yeah, this is gonna be fun. Um, <laughs> I, I know Paul, the Paul that you just referred to, I know that Paul, and, and I know Jesus, the name that you're talking about using, but I don't know you. I don't know you. And, and because I don't know you, <laughs> can you smell what the rock is? I mean, they lay the smack down, right? The demons in this guy whooped 10 dudes. I mean, they left like with no clothes on. Now, when you get beat out your clothes, <laughs> out your clothes, 10 of them, I, I don't know if I could have been the 10th one. I mean, I think once you go through nine, <laughs> I'm not still standing around. You know what I'm saying? But they try to use the name with their authority. They didn't have authority. As Christians, on paper, we have authority. But if you're not submitting to his, his lordship in your life, if he's not ruling, you're going to have a problem. One of the things that shifted for me with the whole idea of, of the kingdom is that I began to look and see and was amazed at how often Jesus talked about the kingdom of God versus the church. He mentions the church twice. He talks about the kingdom a bunch of times. Now, in the next few moments, I want to intentionally overwhelm you with an amount of scriptures just so you can get a glance at his teachings about the kingdom. We're not going to unpack each verse. I simply want you to see a small glimpse. I didn't list all of them because we don't have time for that today. I didn't list all of them, but I want, I want you to get a glimpse of how much the kingdom of God was part of his teaching, part of his message, okay? So uh, let's look at Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four. Verse 17, now 1 through 11 is him in the wilderness dealing with, dealing with the devil. He comes out of there, and this is what happens. I'm going to read these quickly, all right? And I'll put the stuff in red so you can just see it. I'm just going to read them quickly, all right? Again, I want you to just get a sense that this is what this dude was talking about, okay? From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 23, later on in the same chapter. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. What you'll oftentimes see is not as he teaching about the kingdom, but he's demonstrating. That's what Aaron was talking about last week, 
right? In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, Paul says the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk only, but of power. And so you see together the, the declaration of the kingdom and the demonstration of the kingdom, right? This is not just for Jesus. It's not just for the apostles. It's for every believer. That's why we have power and authority, okay? Matthew 9, verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Luke 8, verse 1. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. Next chapter, Luke 9, 11. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, in case you think it's just Matthew and Luke, he says this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel because that's how you would get in. The kingdom of God is here. The way you get in is to repent, turn away from sin, turn to God and believe the gospel. The gospel of what? The gospel of the kingdom. That there is a whole new invisible but superior dominant reality that I'm introducing to you and the way you get in is through me. This is the message that Jesus was preaching. He's not talking about coming to church on Sunday morning. Is it wrong? No. Was that his message? No. Let's continue. Luke chapter 4, verse 43, and he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Now, so not only is he teaching the, the presence of the kingdom, the reality of the kingdom, but then he also teaches about the kingdom. He wants them to understand what the kingdom of God is like. So Matthew 13, he has a whole litany of these. Again, I'll just go through these pretty, pretty quickly. He put another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that the man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the other garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. We'll return to that one if we have time. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. Now, the three measures is about 50 pounds of flour. There will be enough there to make bread for 100 people. So his point here is that the leaven, like just like the mustard seed that starts all small, but it impacts the whole garden. He said the leaven, she put out just a little bit there, but it, it, as she needed it, and rolled it, that little bit of leaven impacted the 50 pounds of the flour because it permeated it everywhere. So the whole thing was leaven. Matthew 13, 24, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Uh, next, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like this. It's like this. It's like this. Not only am I introducing to you the reality of the kingdom, but I want you to know what the kingdom is like when you get in. I want you to know what the kingdom is like as part of its introduction so that you would desire it over this worldly environment and worldly culture. He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is way different than how the world does things. You may have been brought up one way with a set of values and a set of principles and a set of ideas on what you think is the most important, what you should be committing your whole life to, but I'm telling you that in the kingdom of heaven, it's nothing like that. We pursue things that are different. We act ways that are different. And so the kingdom of heaven is like this. So Jesus is breaking it all down because it is a foreign idea to them. They wanted him to come like David in physical form and overthrow their enemies physically. And Jesus is coming to introduce a spiritual, invisible kingdom. And he's leaving the Romans in position. The kingdom of heaven is not like that. It's like this. It's not like that. It's like this. No, I'm not going to cut off Caesar's head. I'm going to forgive women caught in adultery. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, why is this all important? Because if you are supposed to be advancing the kingdom, you might want to know what it's about too. 
When you know what it is like, then you know what it is not like. Hello, Facebook, Instagram feeds. That's not the kingdom. Some of you don't look convinced. I'll continue. So not only does Jesus introduce the kingdom, everywhere he goes, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Then he describes to them what the kingdom is like. Then he's going to tell his disciples to do the same thing. Luke chapter 9, verse 2, and then verse 6. And he sent them out to do what? Proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And they departed and went through all the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Luke 9, verse 60. And Jesus said to them, let let the dead bury their dead. uh, But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. One guy came to him and said, listen, I want to follow you, but I got to go and bury my dad first. We got to have my dad's funeral. And he's like, yeah, no, not really. Uh, I don't do excuses. Let the dead bury the dead. Go and preach the kingdom. Like, are you going to come or not? But he's telling them now to do what? Preach the kingdom. This is the same one who says, I'm going to build my church. That's what he said. I'm going to build my church. How are you going to do it, Jesus? By you preaching the kingdom. When people join the kingdom, they become the church. We've turned church into a weekly program, a weekly event, or even a building. That's not the church. The church is a group of people who put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, to believe that God's plan to forgive us of our sins is to send his son Jesus to die for our mistakes, to die for our sins, the sins that we've committed against God. And when we decide... That, Jesus is, that God's plan of sending Jesus to die for us so that when we put our faith in him and our faith that the blood that he shed is what washes away our sins instead of us doing enough good works to earn our way to heaven, when we put our faith in Christ that God's plan for salvation will work, that's what causes us to be saved. He said, I, I know that there's not enough good things I can do to earn my way to heaven. I know that. God knows that. So he made a bridge. The bridge's name is Jesus. So he died for our sins. Blood has to be shed to cover sins. Not your blood and my blood. We've already messed up. Our blood is impure. There's only one whose blood is pure. There's only one who is a spotless lamb of God. And that was Jesus. He came and he died for us. So when you put your faith in him for salvation, to be united with God, to have your sins forgiven, when you put your faith in him, you become a part of the family of God. You become a part of the body of Christ, the church. It's a group of people, the church. And Jesus builds his own church. He grows his own people. When they hear this invitation, that your sins can be forgiven no matter what you've done because of Jesus Christ. And as you take this message of the gospel and people are believing the gospel, they come into the kingdom. It's more important for them to come into the kingdom right where they are at the mailbox in your neighborhood, at the park, in the break room at your office. They come into the kingdom there. Coming to this building is not a requirement for salvation. So don't act like it is. It's a cool step for a lot of people. It is. But don't think that that's, your only, that's the only card that you play. Because if you think that's the only card that you play, you're going to play that card every single time. And that card doesn't work all the time. The invitation is to the kingdom. Well, what does it look like when... When the kingdom comes then. Variety of verses, Jesus, and Aaron mentioned this one last week. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God or by the finger of God, then you know the kingdom of God has come upon you, right? So there's, there's, the king, there's a kingdom of God, but there's also the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And so he's saying that when you see the kingdom of darkness leaves, it is evidence that the greater, more powerful kingdom is now present. So when you see these demons leave, like you physically can see the demon, a person was, was crazy and now they're not, like the demon left. So he said when you see that, it's a physical indication that the invisible reality of the kingdom of God is present. Also when you see sickness is healed, right? That's a, it's, it's, a, it's a manifestation. You can see something, person was limping, now they're not. Person had cancer, now they don't. You can see that the kingdom of God has come. Right? These are the kind of things that happen. And because this is a reality of the kingdom of God, this is not something that is uh, uh, just reserved for certain people who have special giftings. 
It's for, it's for every believer. As a matter of fact, some people say, well, the only apostles were the ones who had this power. No, because the apostles complained about a guy who they saw who was not an apostle casting out demons. And they thought that Jesus was going to give them a pat on the back because in their mind, it was like, this is the miracle club. <laughs> and there's only 13 of us in it. Us 12 in Jesus. So they said, Jesus, we saw this guy who was casting out demons in your name. Okay, but don't worry, we shut it down. Because he, he didn't have the patch. Like, we got the patch, Jesus, you know. The 12, that's us. And Jesus rebuked them. He said, no, no, don't, don't. Let, let him continue. If he's not against us, he's for us. If he's not against us, he's for us. Watch this. That is a kingdom perspective. When somebody else is doing it, different than how you want to do it. We ain't got to argue over methodology and form and practice. We don't have to argue if they're still doing it. If they're still putting points on the board, then you got to recognize they got the same jersey we got. We're on the same team. You might do it differently, and that's okay. If you're not against us, you're for us. That's what Jesus was trying to tell them. The kingdom comes. There are these supernatural things that happen. These miracles, signs, and wonders. But also when the kingdom comes... There's other things that Jesus also taught and things that not only did he teach, but it was a part of his life for this king to leave his throne and come into a manger. That's what the kingdom is like. All of this power wrapped up in vulnerability and humility. That's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is when these men come and get a woman who was caught in adultery and they bring her in front of Jesus and they have stones in their hands and they say the law of Moses commands us to stone people who are caught in adultery. What do you, what do you say, Jesus? And Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And so one by one, they began to drop their stones and walk away. And Jesus came up to the woman and said, where are your accusers? Because in that day, if your accusers weren't present, the case was dismissed. So Jesus, in his creative, brilliant way, got rid of the accusers. That's why he asked this question. So where are they? Where are your accusers? She says, they're not here. He says, well, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. The kingdom of, that's way different than what people expected. The kingdom of God shows up with compassion, empathy, lack of condemnation in a crowd where everyone is holding stones. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. The kingdom shows up when Jesus tells a parable, he says, the person had this big old party, and one guy went, you know, he thought he was so important, so he went to the head of the table and sat down. And then the, 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 like the MC came and said, hey, bro, this ain't your seat. This ain't your seat. You need to go sit over there. He says, when you go to a party, don't try to sit at the head of the table. Go sit at the least part of the table. And then if you're invited to sit at the head, then let them invite you. Right? The kingdom is taking that seat. When the disciples are arguing about who's the, who's the greatest, who's the greatest? Jesus says, I'm going, I'm, I want you guys just, just to remind you again, um, I'm about to leave you guys. I'm about to go and experience a very excruciating death. I'm going to die on the cross and I'm going to be lied on and all the kind of stuff. But y'all just, just hold tight, right? Just hold tight. Okay, Jesus, but listen, who's going to be the greatest though? Like when you're gone, when you, am I number two? Like when you're gone. And Jesus says, the Gentiles out in the world, they like having power over other people and they lord it over each other. I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I got promoted. I'm in charge. <laughs> he said, that's what they do. But it, not so among you. The greatest is the one who serves, right? He's teaching about the kingdom. He's teaching about character. And so in addition to the miracles, signs, and wonders, there's also... The idea that the kingdom of God does things seem to be opposite of the world in, the, in again, the values and the principles. When that is in our own hearts, when we are aligned with God's heart, then everywhere that we go, everywhere we live, work, learn, and play, we bring the reality of the kingdom, and that emerges to where it changes atmospheres. In the past couple of years, I've come out of the church space, so to speak, as far as my 
professional life, and now I'm more in these marketplace and, and, and secular institutions where I am doing workshops and things like that. And, and, and recently, I was invited to, to be a part of a, um, a school board, to work with a school board for their annual retreat. And they said, you know, typically we, we go over all these different school policies and, and ordinances and all this kind of stuff, but this year, we need to be able to work together. We need someone to help us be united. So we will like to come. Because I don't know nothing about no school boards. So I don't know. That's not my jam, and I don't even want it to be. But you, you want unity? Perhaps you should hire a minister of reconciliation. <laughs> I'm here. You're welcome. Right. So even, they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't say, we need to hire someone who's a pastor or a gospel or a Jesus person. No, we just need unity here. So I've come in and guess what I was talking about? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Confession. Reconciliation. I was talking to another, another client that wanted me to come in and do some emotional intelligence workshop and I was doing it and I was like, this is, this is not it. Y'all need some healing conversations. So, Miss Ma'am, at our next workshop for those three hours, we're gonna have healing conversations. We're gonna talk face to face with each other in this workshop. We're not doing slides, we're not doing handouts. We're having conversations and I'm gonna help facilitate what that means to be, to be vulnerable and open. We all, you can forgive somebody who did something at work because me teaching you what empathy looks like that's not it. You're still holding a grudge from, from 1995. You need to let that go. Right? Reconciliation and healing. What is that? That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. So the signs and miracles and wonders, that's the kingdom. But also choosing humility instead of power. Choosing to, to, to serve instead of trying to rule, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. Being, being free from insecurity that's causing you to destroy relationships, that's, that's the kingdom. You can let people just be people who well, feel like it's your responsibility to change them. That's kingdom. That's kingdom. Let's all stand. I want to remind you that I'm not saying don't invite your friends and family to be a part of this gathering on Sunday. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is I want you to be discerning. I want you to hear God on what exactly the next step for that person should be. It might be that they come to your house. It might be that you work with them for a while before you even invite them here. It might be, well, you know what I'm saying? Like, just, just be discerning. That's not the best step for everyone. And to know that you're not here on the earth to represent the Rock of Roseville. You represent the kingdom. And what God does through the Rock of Roseville is different than what he does through, through Bayside or Bridgeway or Harvest or New Life Community or First Baptist or First Presbyterian. We're all one body and every congregation has, a, has, some, has some aspects of a, a specialty of how God manifests his nature in that community through that congregation. So there's a unique voice that he speaks to this region through the Rock of Roseville. Discern it, discover it, but, but don't be loyal to any other name but the name of Jesus. We advance the kingdom of God. And when you do it where you are, and I do it where I am, you're doing it individually, I'm doing it individually, then collectively that mustard seed begins to grow, begins to grow. 
No farmer. I said we we're going to come back to it if we had time. I'm, squ I'm pushing it now. You and I look at the mustard seed and go, okay, cool, mustard seed. But no farmer wants mustard seeds in their garden and in their farm. Because mustard seeds dominate and control. And, and they subjugate all the other fruits, vines, or whatever that's in the area. And Jesus said, the kingdom is like this. It starts off small, seems insignificant, but over time, it is impactful. It is impactful. The superiority of it is seen. The dominance of it is seen. When I say dominance, I don't mean like controlling. Nope, nope. I mean when you're, when you're humility, when you're saying, Father, forgive them from the cross, that's dominant. Where you know how to keep your peace, that's dominant. That's superior because that's love. This is how we love people. If we experience his love, we will trust its power to change other people when you have seen it change your own life. That's why it's important to not forget, like everyone's saying, not forget. God's going to be reminding you of stuff. Remember this? Remember when I was patient with you? Remember that? He's going to talk to you because he don't want you to be judgmental to other people. Do you remember when, do you, remember when you were crazy? <laughs> like, do you, re, do, do you remember when you were crazy? Do you remember when you were smoking and sleeping? Do you remember when you, do you remember? Do you remember what he brought you out of? Do you remember how you looked? Do you remember how you acted? Then get off the high horse and know this. We sang this song, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great feeling, isn't it? His goodness is running after me. Right? That's a good feeling. Well, guess what? His goodness is running after other people too. And sometimes he wants to use you as his feet. You gonna be excited about that? Huh? Okay. Okay. Then when, he, when, then when you catch him, he wants them to experience his goodness, not your judgment. That, that's a different song. <laughs> My judgment is running after. It's running after everybody. My fear and insecurity. <laughs> that's a different song. No, that's not how the song. Your goodness. Your goodness. That was running after me is running after them. Your goodness. Your goodness. That's why we like the song. It's goodness. Okay. All right. Speaking of running, I'm running out of time. So we. Aaron, why don't you just come on up? I don't really know how to close this, but just bring you on up. Just... I'll let you figure it out. Oh, man. Can we just thank Dr. John again? Can we just say? Man, hearing truth is just kind of like taking a deep breath of like fresh air. Um, and it's true, the truth sets you free. And part of what that means is that when you get set free from something, you're no longer bound to the thing that you were bound to before. And it actually then means that you're under your own self-discipline, right? Which means that there's impetus put on us to actually, you're free now, you're not bound, you get to make the choice to live in light of the kingdom of God. So I'm going to pray for us. And actually, I'm going to invite um, our prayer team, people to come forward, elders if you're here as well. There's a lot here. Today, Some of you, you might have heard the gospel, you might have heard the, the news that you can actually be forgiven from your sins, you might have heard that for the first time today, and that might be what the Lord's pulling on you about. If that is, we want you to come down and let us pray for you and talk to these people up here. And some of you, again, we talked about last week and John mentioned again today, when you talk about the kingdom, there's the power to demonstrate the kingdom present. So some of you, you might be bound by something. You might be sick. You might be in pain. We want to pray for you if you'll let us. 
And outside of that, if you just need prayer, please come forward. We want to pray for you. So I'll pray, close us, and then we can have a good rest of our Sunday. So Father, we thank you that you invited us into a kingdom and not an institution, like Dr. John was saying. Jesus, teach us how to live in the kingdom of God. Teach us how to live in that. And Father, I'm for specifics, I'm asking that you would show us the people that you've placed in our lives that need the next step, that you would tell us what that is and give us the simple steps to just obey you and invite them into what you're doing. So God, we bless you and I bless your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.